Our text this morning is found in Matthew chapter 27. We'll be looking at verses 27 to 44. I invite you to turn there. And as I mentioned earlier, this is Palm Sunday. Unfortunately, Palm Sunday was back in Matthew 21. <laughs> a distant memory to me who worked so methodically and slowly through a book. But uh, if you remember, and I'm sure you do, on that occasion, Jesus came riding into Jerusalem. The crowd spread their garments and palm branches on the path in front of him, a measure of respect, I'm sure. And they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. And today, fast forward through most of that Passion Week, we call it. What do we see as Jesus has been sentenced and is now about to be led to the cross and nailed and hung on the cross? We see mockers mocking, 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 mocking. I could have divided it into three points in my message. They would have been very easy to remember. Point number one, mocking. Point number two, mocking. Point number three, just to vary it a little bit, would be mocking. <laughs> or I could have used some of the variations of the meanings of the Greek words that were behind this. But when you look at Matthew 27, starting in verse 28, the soldiers mocked him. That's a word that means to play with, to trifle with. They mocked him by not taking him seriously. And then when you get down to verse 39, there were those who passed by, just walking by, perhaps attracted by the throng and the noise and maybe having heard that there would be a crucifixion and the spectacle was entertainment to them. But it says in verse 39 that those who passed by blasphemed him which is a word that is taken directly from the Greek. So when you say blasphemed, you're speaking the Greek language. And it means to vilify. It really means to insult, to slander. And so it's about a jeering, insulting comment from the crowd. Verse 4 tells us the chief priests also mocked. That's like what the soldiers did, the jeering, trifling with, playing with him. But then at the very end of our text for today, verse 44, we read that the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him, a word that means to reproach him. They actually rebuked Jesus in a taunting kind of way. So there's the playing, there's the insulting in a jeering sense, and then there's the taunting reproach, mocking, mocking, mocking. So I didn't really divide it into three segments. I just think what we see here is that we are to conclude from God's revelation that when Jesus hung on the cross, Yes, there was physical pain, but no, the gospel writers do not elaborate on the physical pain. What they show us is the taunting and the mocking and the jeering and the pain that must have been involved with that. I don't like to be laughed at. I've learned most of you don't either. Even my grandchildren who do some of the funniest things really don't like to be laughed at and can take it quite personally if, if they think I am. So let's look at Matthew chapter 27, starting in, ver or starting in verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. 
when they had twisted a crown of thorns, if you wondered what that might look like, there's one right down here on our communion table. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! That's a distinctly Gentile perspective. The Israelites would have said, King of Israel. They said, King of the Jews. Even then, the name Jews was an insulting kind of name. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, or when they were done playing with him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. <clears throat> but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him. Four words is all that's devoted to all of the agony, physical agony that involved. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, not necessarily to Jesus, but to each other, He saved others. Himself He cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Yeah, I doubt that, but okay. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. That's a lot of mocking. <laughs> All these verses, with the exception of that little section about Simon, who wasn't really doing it out of the goodness of his heart, but because a soldier was standing there with a spear in hand telling him to do it, and he had no choice, but a little bit of mercy in carrying that cross. Other than that, it's just mocking, mocking, mocking. At the end, I think, I hope to show you why Matthew puts this front and center, why it's important for us to know this. And then hopefully you will understand better about some things in your own life. So we start out here in verse 27 after the Jewish people had had their trial, after they had dragged Jesus to Pilate, after they had twisted Pilate's arm saying, you know, with trumped up charges, we want you to crucify Jesus and would not take no for an answer. Though he tried, he offered other alternatives, offered them Barabbas uh, or Jesus instead of Barabbas, but no, they wanted Barabbas. And even his wife warned him, don't have anything to do with this. This isn't good, this is wrong. He washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. But when it came right down to it, he was the one who delivered them, who delivered Jesus to be crucified. 
And he handed them, at this point, Jesus is now completely in the control of the Roman soldiers. The Jewish people have done their thing. They're bystanders. They're watching to make sure it gets fulfilled. But they could not put him to death. The Romans had to. And so it is these soldiers, specifically the soldiers of the governor, who took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole garrison, and et cetera, began to just play with him like he was a toy. Now, there's some interesting things about this, and since we have a couple hours before the service is over, I'm sure you don't mind if I delve into this a little bit, but... Uh, is that a little grumbling I heard? You see, Pilate didn't live in Jerusalem. Pilate lived in Caesarea. The praetorium is the title of the home where the governor lived. Or wherever he happened to be staying, it was called the praetorium, kind of like what we call our White House here in the United States. And if the president isn't in residence, say he's out on a ranch in California or at a resort in Florida, it becomes the Western White House or the Southern White House or whatever title people want to give to it. That's the word praetorium. Presumably, wherever it was, and we don't know, it could have been Herod's residence, it could have been a place they kept just for this, but there would have been some barracks for the soldiers, for the garrison. So it wasn't just a handful. We're told that the whole troop or whole garrison was gathered around and entered into this playing with Jesus. And I use that word because that's the meaning of the word mocking. It's a compound word, and half of the word is a word that is used to describe what boys do. I mean, what boys do, very specifically in the male gender. What do boys do? You know that. They play. They play. It's hard for boys to be serious for very long. It's in their nature to play. And soldiers, being big boys, <laughs> and probably bored for most of their duty time, saw this as a little bit of a, an entertainment, a, a, a little distraction from their ordinary duties. And so they all piled out of the barracks, gathered around, and they started playing with him. We're told they took off his clothes. That must have been a painful thing because he had been beaten so severely. We are convinced that he was bleeding. Uh, that's just what the scourge would have done. So uh, it, whatever bleeding might have stopped and, and his clothes stuck to him, it was ripped off. They found a scarlet robe. That's the color the officers wore. So probably somewhere in the barracks, there would have been a discarded officer's coat or cloak or tunic. And they put this on him and they thought, scarlet, that's close enough to purple. That purple is the color of royalty. Uh, and so they got this theme going that he's accused of being a king. Well, let's just playfully pretend he is a king. And it reminded me of children who dress up and have props and go through the motions, and that's what they were doing. Putting the robe on Jesus, handing him the scepter. They were play acting, only he was the um, kind of unwilling participant in this play. They twisted a crown of thorns, plunked that on his head. I'm sure they were none too gentle, and that produced its own level of pain. Put the reed in his hand and said, here, here's your scepter. And then they just proceeded to mock him, showing that this man who is before them, and obviously in no way a king, was claiming to be king. Well, that's what they had been told, so that's what they went with. And there it is. Mocking, mocking, mocking. Hail, King of the Jews, they said to him. And then, as we say, adding insult to injury, but I think it was more insult to insult, they spat on him. There'd be no reason for soldiers to do that except to humiliate him. 
except to add to his discomfort and his mortification, his humiliation, all of this, one thing after another, because it was done in public, in front of the soldiers. We, if we were in Jesus' shoes, would have wished the ground would open up and swallow us whole. Am I right? This is just the kind of thing that you can't take. Now, remember, Jesus had endured an awful lot before this. He had not had any sleep the night before. He had been kept awake there in the high priest's house with that mock trial. And then they scourged him, and the scourging was none too gentle. So that would have weakened him physically. And then now he's going through this. And I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning refreshed and ready to go, I can handle a little bit of humiliation. But, you know, about five seconds of that is enough, and I'm ready for it to be done and get on with something better, more pleasant. And Jesus was so physically weakened, and now to have this heaped on him. I'm emphasizing this because I believe the Gospels emphasize it. Not so much the agony of the cross, but the agony of how the people were viewing him. And I suspect it would have bothered Jesus. However, what people thought of him or what they did to him did not seem to faze him. He was all about doing the Father's business, revealing the Father to the people urging them to repent for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He had a job to do, and it just didn't matter if things happened to him that were, in the normal course of events, humiliating or worse. I suspect we could learn from that. We get a little bit of trouble and a little ache and a pain, and all of a sudden we're out of commission. <laughs> Please don't take that personally. If, if you've got something going on that's serious, I, I'm not meaning to make you feel guilty, but sometimes it doesn't take much to sideline us when it comes to serving the Lord. It would behoove us to consider what Jesus endured and think of how he was treated and how he responded to that. So they spat on him, they struck him, they mocked him, and then, of course, they ripped that officer's robe off and put his own clothes back on him. And when it was time, he was led away to be crucified. Such a simple phrase. He was led away to be crucified. Not unlike in verse 35 when I pointed out those four words, then they crucified him. We do not have in our Bible a description of a Roman crucifixion. We have to go to outside sources. Other historians like Josephus have described in greater detail exactly what it entailed. And of course, archaeologists have dug up the evidence and verified what those uninspired historians have said. But in scripture, all we have is they crucified him. They nailed him to the cross. Later, he was able to show the nail wounds in his hands, in his feet, and the spear wound in his side. Those were real things. They actually happened. But that's not the focus of the New Testament. The focus is always on what that death on the cross accomplished for us. And part of our focus today is what he endured as he was led to and nailed to the cross. It was all about his, his being mocked, his being taunted, the jeering, the reproaches, the, the insults. All of that he endured. And why did he do that? For us. Because that's what we deserve. For our sin. Mind-boggling. Jesus took what we deserved so that he could give us what we do not deserve, his grace and the salvation, the relationship with the Father, like what he has, his righteousness. So there we have it. They led him away to be crucified. Verse 32, we have this little interjection in the scenario. And I don't know exactly why it's included 
God thinks it's important, so we should think it's important. About on the trip out to Golgotha, which, by the way, we have no idea where it is or why it was called the place of a skull. Some suggest this and that, uh, but there's nothing definitive, and we cannot go to a particular place in Israel today and say this is Golgotha. For that matter, we're not even sure that it's a hill, but boy, do we sing about the hill of Golgotha and uh, climbing the hill and the mountain and so on and so forth. But the scripture doesn't really spell that out for us. So they brought him, and on the way, as was the custom, the accused and convicted criminal was forced to bear the cross. And we understand that that probably wasn't the full cross with the upright portion and then the cross beam. It more likely was just the heavy cross beam. Think about carrying something along the order of a, of a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12 landscaping timber that would be wide, long enough for a man's outstretched hand, so let's say six feet. That would be a load for any of us, not that most of us are in all the greatest shape. I'm not, so I, I can under, but, but Jesus had been so mistreated and weakened from the loss of blood, etc. It's no wonder that when he got going and they made him carry it, that he just could not and probably stumbled and fell. And there was a man standing there and the soldiers just looked around because they weren't going to stoop to carry a criminal's cross. That was somebody else's job. And they just singled Simon out of the crowd. We don't know anything about him, but the gospel writer Mark says, this man was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Oh, okay, that, that clears it up. We know Alexander and Rufus, don't we? No, we don't. But the early church did. Otherwise, why would Mark mention it? They must have been a vital part of the early church, those Alexander and Rufus boys, Simon's boys. What does that tell you? Well, nothing definitive, but it makes you wonder, did Simon see something in Christ that day that attracted him to the sinless one who died for us sinners? Did he get gloriously saved? Did he go home to Cyrene with the good news of the gospel? And did he share that with his family so that his boys were caught up and, and understood it for themselves and trusted Jesus and somehow got involved in the early church in a way that they became known as the sons of the man who carried Jesus' cross? Sometimes it happens that way. We don't know, but we surmise. So they came to Golgotha, place of a skull. We don't know where it is. It was, again, a customary thing for a condemned man to be given this drink. It's described as sour wine mingled with gall. What we suspect is something that the ladies in Jerusalem concocted and provided to the soldiers, um, something that uh, had a little uh, anesthesia in it to numb the senses, to just take the edge off, to make it so you're not just so on edge and, and um, feeling everything that your nerves are screaming at you. And what did Jesus do? He, he picked it up, he took a sip of it, or they held it to his lips, and, and he took a tiny drink and he said, no, I don't want that. because I believe Jesus wanted to experience everything fully that was involved in his humiliation and his crucifixion. He wanted to suffer the greatest that God had for him. Why? Well, I'm kind of glad because when we're told that we don't have a high priest who doesn't understand our suffering, but in fact we do have a high priest who has experienced our suffering, we know that he didn't cut corners. He didn't say, load me up with some morphine so I won't feel much and then do your worst. He experienced it all. So that when we cry to him with our pain, 
He can wrap his arm around our shoulders and say, I've been there. I know you're hurting. And I know what that pain feels like. That's part of why I think the gospel writers emphasize this mocking, mocking, mocking section of of Jesus' story. So that when we experience that, we can go to him and when he says, I've been there and I know what you're going through, we're convinced. We believe him. So he wouldn't drink this anesthesia or this drugged wine that might have taken the edge off. Then they crucified him. It's all we have. I'm not going to elaborate because you know the story. And I don't want to tug at your emotions. God doesn't do that here. I don't need to. He hung on a cross because God had said, those who hung on a tree are accursed. Jesus was hung on a cross, nailed to a tree, so to speak. The the Greek word is the same for being hung on a tree as nailed to the cross. They used it interchangeably. So he hung on that cross because that's what God said would be required to offer us salvation. So powerful. He was crucified. And then, as if we'd be interested, they divided up his garments. A portion of his garments were sewn together and they could tear apart the seams and come up with four different segments and so they threw dice and decided who was going to get which portion of that garment that could be easily divided but we're told in one of the other gospels that the outer garment was so well constructed that they would would not want to tear it apart or could not tear it apart it was a seamless garment and so they cast lots or threw down dice or whatever they did to uh, decide which of the four soldiers supervising this crucifixion would get it. But the important thing, according to Matthew, is that it is a fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy from Psalm 22, verse 18, spoken hundreds of years earlier from the pen of David. I almost read Psalm 22, but I I I think you can do that on your own. And it says, 700 years before it happened, they divided my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. God knew that would take place, and it did. Confirmation that this is God at work. As we said a, a week ago from a comment somebody made to me on the way out the door, it was miraculous how every single detail fell into place. Everybody was where they needed to be at a given time to accomplish a certain purpose, and God oversaw the whole thing. And that's exactly how it happened, including fulfilling a prophecy that you would say is a pretty minor one. What happened to his clothes? Who cares? God cares. Showing that he knew it was part of his plan. And verse 36, sitting down, they kept watch over him there because sometimes a man wouldn't die very quickly, and if there were no soldiers, they could show up, and if there were enough of them and the crowd didn't prevent them, they could uh, take the person down and nurse him back to health, but the soldiers were there to make sure the sentence was carried out. We're also told they put up over his head that accusation, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, there are several things about this, that make us, um, that that just remind us of how um, they were doing things that conveyed one message in their minds, but God wanted us to get another message. They were speaking truth even when they thought they were mocking. For example, way back at the beginning in verse 27, The soldiers of the governor took Jesus. One commentator said, I wonder if Matthew is mocking the mockers. Because, yes, they were the soldiers of the governor. They were Romans. But whose bidding were they doing? It wasn't really Pilate's. He said, I wash my hands of this. 
He didn't want anything to do with it. It was the Jewish people. So were they soldiers of the governor or were they soldiers doing the bidding of the Jewish people? And then what we stop and say is, wait a minute, it was neither. These were soldiers who were doing what God had planned from before the foundation of the world. And on they go, the whole hail king of the Jews. Well, he was, just not in the way they pictured. They mocked him, but in their words, they were speaking truth. And, and the um, accusation written against him, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. I, I think the idea, although the Jewish people said, no, you shouldn't put it that way. You should say, he said he was. And Pilate said, no, the way it is, that's how it stands. But in a sense, I believe they thought they were mocking him because what king would allow this to happen? What king would endure this or put himself through this or end up on the cross, he's no king. And yet he was, just not the king they thought. Then in verse 38, the two robbers crucified with him. In verse 39, more mocking those who pass by. One commentator says there are three groups of people, the passerbys, the chief priests and their allies, and then those who were crucified with them. Each of them had something mocking to say. And this commentator said, Jesus was mocked by ignorant sinners, the passerbys, by religious sinners, the chief priests and allies, and the condemned sinners. Pretty much every demographic got their dig in. They had to play with Jesus in this taunting, jeering way. And so the passerbys said, uh, wagging their head, which basically means their physical actions uh, were in accord with their words, seizing on what had been brought up in the Jewish trial and used to, um, to convict him, though it was a misquote, we studied that, but they bring it up again. You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. He did not. He did not say that. But then if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. The fascinating thing about that is they and the chief priests and allies who said kind of the same thing, if he really is the king of Israel, he can save himself. He could come down. We'd believe him then. They're basically saying, if you do the miracle that I tell you to do, I'll believe you. I'll believe you're the son of God. And you know what? We have the exact opposite view, don't we? They said, he stayed on the cross, therefore he must not have been the Son of God. If he had come down, that would have proven he was the Son of God. And we say, he stayed on the cross, that proves he was the Son of God. He stayed on the cross. As we said a week or two ago, Jesus' own words, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself so that I can raise it again. He stayed on the cross. And that proves he was the son of God. They were saying the opposite, though it wasn't true. He was indeed the son of God. He didn't have to perform for them with miracles at their bidding. He did what God wanted him to do, the father. And that showed he was the son of God. Even the robbers, verse 44, they were, they were actual criminals who'd had an actual trial, a legitimate one, and were actually condemned, convicted and condemned. They deserved to be on those crosses on either side of Jesus. And they reviled him with the same thing. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us this, but one of the other gospels says, one of the robbers came to his senses and asked Jesus to pardon him. The other one just kept on in his blindness and his hardened heart. But they reviled him. They, they um, uh, blasphemed and taunted him and 
chided and reproached him. What an incredibly foolish thing for them to do. But it depicts, shows for us, just how blind they were. Now here's what I'd like to do. Throughout all this portion of scripture we've been reading and thinking about this morning, Jesus was reviled, played with, jeered at, taunted, reproached, ridiculed. I have three passages of scripture I want to leave you with. You can jot down the reference or you can turn there if you choose. But at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we have this lengthy section in Matthew we call the Sermon on the Mount. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5, he begins to teach the multitudes and he tells them what it truly means to have a blessed life. A life where God is smiling upon you. It's this kind of life and it's counterintuitive. It's different, vastly different from what the world says is a good and blessed life. But here's what Jesus says. Verse 11 Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. No one who heard him on that day at the beginning of his public ministry could have in their wildest imagination considered how Jesus' life would conclude, his earthly life would conclude, being reviled and persecuted and people saying wicked and evil things falsely about him. And yet he shows that we can have the same response to those negative things by on the cross, rejoicing and being exceedingly glad. Any sorrow that Jesus showed in his heart was a, an, an attitude towards the wickedness, the darkness of sin. There was a sadness about it, but I believe there was a joy knowing, as Jesus knew, he was doing this for us. Then if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, the church has, has begun, it's still early, it's in its infancy. These little fledgling churches are being planted all across the civilized world and popping up here and there, some of them needing help and instruction, and one of them, Ephesus, the Apostle Paul sends his right-hand man, Timothy, his troubleshooter, and he sends Timothy, and in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, one of my favorite verses, bodily exercise prophets only a little bit, goes on to say, Godliness is profitable for all things because it has a promise for the life that now is and of that which is to come. And having this in mind, Godliness is profitable, profitable now, profitable in the future. Paul begins to make this serious pronouncement. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach. There's the same word that's translated mocking in Matthew chapter 27. We both labor and we suffer mocking because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Paul had experienced some trials in his lifetime, hadn't he? He lists them in his letters to Corinth, all of the things he experienced, shipwrecked, being stoned, etc. And here he writes to Timothy, and maybe not all of those things had happened by this time when he writes. I don't know the timing. But um, he says, 
there's a purpose for our labor and for our suffering mocking because it confirms, it strengthens our trust in the living God. It reminds us he's the savior of all men, especially those who believe. You see, whatever humiliating experiences we have when we bring up Christ and people begin to titter and, and, uh, and say unkind things and chuckle and laugh and uh, how absolutely medieval you are to believe such ancient fables as what the Bible has to say. And, and you start to talk about things like abortion and about men and women and marriage and things that God has clearly said. And what does the world do? Drowns you out with laughter. How can you be so foolish, so naive to believe that kind of stuff? Well, here's our answer. We believe that. We repeat that. We state it with confidence because God has said it. And we suffer mocking because we trust in the living God who's the savior of all who believe. One more in 1 Peter chapter 4. We were looking at some of Peter's writings in Sunday school, but that was 2 Peter. 1 Peter, it'll be chapter 4, verse 14. But let me remind you that this first letter Peter wrote was to those who had been scattered out, the believers who had been scattered because of persecution. They went to try to find a place that was just a little more agreeable and amenable to letting them live there. And, and they were planting churches, but yet they, they still were hurting because of the reproaches and the suffering and the mocking that they experienced. So that's the people to whom Peter is writing. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, after saying, don't, don't think it's strange that odd stuff happens to you. Um, it, it's, it's not that odd. It's not strange. Jesus experienced it. Why shouldn't you? He says in verse 13, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Now, most of us stumble over those words because we've never been nailed to a cross. We've never been scourged with a cat of nine tails. We've never had a crown of thorns put on our head. We've never experienced the exact same things Jesus did. But he was mocked, 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 mocked. And we are to rejoice in the extent that we partake of Christ's sufferings. That was part of his sufferings. Because, Peter says, you can be glad so that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And then to get more specific in verse 14, if you are reproached, that's the word for mocked that we found in Matthew 27. If you are mocked, if you're played with for the name of Christ, blessed are you. <laughs> I call that full circle. Jesus said it at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when, when you are persecuted, uh, reviled and persecuted. Now Peter, who had experienced that himself, says, If you are reproached or mocked for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, they think he's, they're blaspheming. They are blaspheming Jesus, and they are. But on your part, he is glorified. How would he be glorified? Well, I suspect he would be glorified when we respond to mocking the way Jesus did. We shouldn't care what people think of us. We should care what they think of God. It shouldn't matter to us if we are uncomfortable around people because they see things differently and they laugh at the way we believe and our worldview and our understanding of scripture. 
and they try to make us feel small. It shouldn't matter to us. What should matter to us is what mattered to Jesus, the salvation of their lost souls. And he endured the cross and the mocking, the reviling, the blaspheming, the taunting, the jeering. He did that so that God could save us from our sin. Take it away, forgive it, and give us Christ's righteousness. Father, I am so glad that you've shown us this today, that you've shown us this segment of what Jesus endured as he was taken to the cross and left there to die. I'm glad because it really relates to where we are and how we live. What we may be called to endure and we have this example and this partner who has experienced what we may experience so that we know how to respond ourselves, so that we know what's truly important. And it's not our comfort, but it's your glory. Thank you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.